earlier today, I figured, earlier in this conversation, I figured out exactly what the difference was between intelligence and awareness. Intelligence is just the clock speed of your processor versus awareness being basically your, your capacity to lateralize, to loop, to loop through another, not to, not to iterate, but to loop. Yeah, I got it. And uh, curse. When, when, you can, when you can jump out, out of the linear and look down at the, that's how, that's how you look down at patterns. Yeah. In the same way, if you're walking in an orchard field, then uh, from certain vantage points, it can seem chaotic. And as you walk, everything is chaotic. There are glimpses of complete orders as you walk, you know, yeah. in the way that's completely ordered. But the real trick is to go, above to go above them. Then you get the whole thing. And then you realize that people who are like, is it chaotic or is it ordered? You know, that at a sufficiently, at, at awareness, that question is something that people on the lower level talk about. And that's okay, it's not bad. But if you look down, it doesn't make sense. It's difficult to get to those levels of awareness. Yeah, but in a sense, all awareness is one level. That's part, and that's part of the trick. I found that there are, like in logic, there's axioms. In awareness, in awarenesses, there's also like axioms of awareness. Oh my God, that might that, that might be like uncharted territory intellectually. Ah, that's cool, but. I started like seeing them as that and referring to them as that when I did 2C with Lindsay. And I just took like three of the like axioms of awareness and just kept saying them over and over again in different ways. And she was just loving it so much. <laughs> like, and doing that to somebody logically is practically like sexual ecstasy. Because you're it's like recursive humor, but it's also teaching you. But it's teaching you recursively, and you know that. It, it, it's, it's crazy. And I'm, I'm going to work on writing down those axioms, though. They're hard to grasp, because your mind's set up to grasp, you know, like the iterative way of doing things. But as you bend it towards the recursive way of doing things, you begin to be able to grasp each sub-layer of recursion as an iteration. Sorry, so, man. Well, it's just like the more you use the definition... Oh, is, is it getting worse lost? Yes. Oh, man, <laughs> it's got it. Because uh, an uh, important thing I did with her was that I didn't go further. She didn't know what something meant, and that's why over the course of a few hours, I said the same couple things in different ways to her, and uh, she told me, you're good at that, and I, and I said, what am I good at? And uh, she tried to think about it, she said she didn't know, and I said, no, if you, here's an exercise, if you can identify that thing, you will also be good at that thing. Just try and identify what it is that I'm being good at. And uh, the whole time what it was, was one of the things I was saying over and over again was that we were just trying to look at ourselves. And as people in our lives, everything that we do is just trying to look at our, or it should be. When things go bad, we never realize it, but it's because we're looking outward rather than trying to figure out who we are kind of thing. When you have a center in yourself, that's like step one. And that accounts for almost all hard lessons in life, just having a center in yourself. If you have your center out floating with other people, then when you try and look at yourself, you're looking out and now you're double fucked. So you're talking about like a locus of control? Uh, that sounds like the sort of thing you would know about. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what, what that means. What do you mean by center? Center. I don't... Honestly, I don't have a... Uh, 
every time I've said it, I've realized that I'm not sure exactly what it means, but... I don't know, I'll figure that out. I, I've just been using the phrase because I feel like everybody is familiar with that. Well, it's not like... Have you heard it before, or are you legitimately like not familiar with the phrase? I've heard it used in a variety of different ways. Okay. Have, and the funny, like, the, the joke is, having a center in yourself is good, but being self-centered is bad. Having a center in yourself means you refer to yourself in issues of anything regarding virtue and morality, rather than looking for external guides. And as you practice, ref of course, I mean, you're not going to be good when you start, but as you practice, apparently, I, guess, I, I, would, I would say it's resonance. But as you continue, as you practice referring to yourself and then getting feedback after making decisions and then going well or not, after practicing referring back to yourself, uh, that has to do, I forgot where I was going, but that has to do with the center in yourself and that self-referential process is the looking at yourself thing. Having integrity is done by looking at yourself. Being honest is the ability to look at yourself. Everything actually comes into being able to looking at yourself. Okay. And uh, then I then I did a whole thing about it was it was it was beautiful what I did and I can't remember it, but it had to do with relating original sin with the people that are most like Bible clutching are the people that are most originally sinful. They're they're clutching the gods so much. And yet they are... Is this like Christianity is a religion for sinners? Yes, but... The original sin is a mistake that was made by Adam accidentally... Or accidentally... Maybe not accidentally, I don't know. Adam wasn't looking at himself. And that was the only mistake that was made. Because there was a fruit that would bestow upon them divine qualities. And it's obvious from the beginning, in every way that it was said, that Adam and Eve were created as divine beings. They were created in his image. But God fucked up in there. Because Adam and Eve thought they weren't divine. And the only way they could have thought that was by not just looking at their own selves, and they went and got the fruit because they thought it would bestow upon them divinity. And that's what people do when they go toward religion. And, uh, you know, they eat the fruit, and as they eat the fruit, they become ashamed. And shame is... might as well just be the symbol of everything bad about consciousness. Shame is the retraction of consciousness. Either socially or internally, or in, a, in any sense. It's in a, in a bodily sense, in a conscious sense, you can't think about anything but what you just did. You know, you, you attract away, you look down, and people want you to look down. They don't want you to, like, you know, look up, and that's not how you're supposed to be when you're ashamed. So they want you to not be. Shame is the retraction of any conscious activity. Conscious activity is almost fairly... It's outward and inward at once. It's motion, but shame is a is a retraction. It's a it's a clenching, and what two C E does, and we I use this so much in the like the teaching part of it. Two C E makes you want to clench, like every muscle in your body is it, it clenches inward, and uh, there's a cycle in your mind. Your mind has a certain psychedelic effect that's pleasurable. And as you clench inward, it gets more and more intense. And you, there's an asymptote because with the clenching, you know, you can just keep, you know what I mean? But the fact is, it's gonna hurt a lot. And it, it, it hurts a lot the next day if you do, if you're not in, if you're not aware that you're clenching. And the thing is, when people clench completely, the, cl the, more, the longer you've let them clench, the harder it is to pry them apart. But when they do that, they're experiencing that one effect as a crescendo. 
but if you if you open up again and then clench more, you experience the next one. So by you can choose to experience just one more and more, and then the pain stacks up, or you can experience, or you can not ex simultaneously experience and not experience it at all. You cannot need to. And then honestly, you know, like in acidic thinking about it, you know, clenching was seen as part of the spiritual motion of the universe. In Eastern stuff where they talk about uh, the way they approach good and evil and yin and yang and like male and female energies, all, all they're doing is they're saying there's something exists and there's a difference. And from that difference, only one difference, all interesting things happen. The universe happens because of mm -hmm. one difference. So there's one difference and yet there's one thing. Because really, what the male and female want to do is they want to realize they're actually the same thing. And all that stuff. And they go through all, they go through a crazy journey just to become themselves. Or just to look at themselves, to realize that they are themselves. And that was the God story I, I showed out to her. Because in religion, from the story of Adam and Eve being recursive in that each person that believes in it causes it, causes their own story, and they don't realize it because they're not aware of what the story means. When I was thinking about how I was using a listener to think, I realized that, okay, all that's going on is my mind's inventing a point over there, but why is it important? Why can't I just make a point over there? Why does it have to be a listener? Because and synesthetically, and I think I still think this is right, when I saw what happened, and you know, I went in mentally, and what it is, is somehow the way my brain does things, and this and this could be, this is a metaphor, or it might not be, I don't know. But my brain perceives what I'm saying as a string going out to you of stuff. It's, it's traveling in a communication stream. And uh, as you're receiving it, the act of you listening, some part of me, my concept of I, and what I am entirely, I devote some chunk of it to being you so that I can have empathy with you and I can imagine what it's like for you to be hearing things. So when I use you as a listener, I take that chunk and that allows me to have a doubled out awareness of what I'm saying. I can be aware of entire sentences at a time and more than that. And I can be aware of a stream or a theme of thoughts rather than just sort of like one at a time. I'm smearing out my awareness across time by imagining another listener. And in another sense, we maybe that's what God is doing right now with all this. <laughs> and uh, and with in in Greek philosophy, they always like to say how philosophy is not something you do internally. Philosophy is in conversation with people. When you have one have a good conversation with somebody, just ask them about themselves, so that you can eventually steer the conversation where you actually want it before they're aware where you're talking about yourself. So, and it's understandable that you would want to look at yourself because, I mean, or you, want to, you would want to know yourself, or you want to think about yourself when you can barely know or understand or think about anything else. You know, how, how am I, how am I going to understand what's going on in somebody else's mind when I got direct access to mine? At least, I better figure this out first before I start messing with this guy. And love has to do with that too. I guess, you know, like, internal development of love. Uh, love is love is not loving how somebody makes you feel something, somebody else making you feel something externally, but love is in loving them. And, uh, yeah, but as, as people become aware of looking at themselves through technology, basically all we do is we look at ourselves and, uh, you know, with the amount of camera stuff where we're just looking at ourselves and looking at other people and uh, then hopefully in the future we'll be able to do like 
record our dreams and perceptions into digital data and then exchange those, eventually we will have finally looked at ourselves. And if we completely look at ourselves, we'll know what we were the entire time. And that's just the statement about God. That's just, God is not a thing at the end. It's, it's almost the process of looking at yourself. Process of experiencing. Yeah. Subjectivity. Subjectively. Right. Asking the question, what happens to you after you die, is like asking the question, what happens to your lap when you stand up from a chair? Or what happens to the fistness of your fist when you open your hand? Death is a meaningless concept. As we're pressed up against the next layer or level of awareness, it begins to feel bad for us. But the further up you go, it feels less and less bad because it's all turning into indistinction anyway. But when, when you're near the bottom, it's so hard to get up each level. It's, it's an exponential thing going on here. And as you approach crossing one, there's more and more pain. And uh, the level that a lot of people are at, they don't realize, is that, say when you're a teenager or when you're around anywhere from like, any, uh, I'm not even, forget the age thing. At some point in your life, you, you figure out a couple things, and you're pretty sure about these things. And now you're going to walk around in reality seeing other people fucking their lives up because they haven't figured out these things. Or they're saying dumb shit because they didn't figure out these obvious things that I just figured out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get frustrated at them. And uh, that level, that layer of awareness, to completely go over it, would be to have compassion for the ignorant rather than self-pain on seeing that they don't know something. I mean, why would you be frustrated that they don't know something? And why would you get mad at them for doing something because they didn't know better? What the fuck's going on in your head? Because they, they didn't know better. Why are you going to get mad at them? Why are you going to punish them? Or why are you going to get upset at yourself? The, you, you would either have compassion or serenity regarding the situation. So a lot of times when at certain ages it's more... Like, the, when people start figuring out some things, you get frustrated with how other people are dumb. When the joke is that you're dumb too, it's just that in five years you're going to realize how dumb you were then. Because you've gone up awareness. Awareness can only really look down, because the chaos is infinite, and so is, so is the curving. And I think that conversations like this have been had since the beginning of humans being able to talk. They've tended to be rare, but this thing is something that people of each people in each generation have figured it out. And uh, what's cool is, and in every generation they have their own coolness, and that's part of why you keep doing it. Part of how life continually wants to, life is effort, effort to extropy rather than entropy. It's, it's that strange of a phenomenon. But what's cool about doing it at this time or in this generation is I'm recording these types of thoughts for the first time and doing it by video where we'll be better able to see ourselves over time. Because it doesn't matter if like, you know, probably, well, an unknown number of people watch the video. It'll be over 100, but no one can really know because it depends on what happens in the future for that. But it, what I was going to say is it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have anything to do with who's listening. It has to do with the fact that they can listen. The fact that they can listen is the fact that they can look at themselves in a cheating way. Because when you're look, you think you're looking at somebody else. That's the only way you can look at yourself 
without looking at yourself, by thinking you're looking at somebody else. Yeah. It's why I always record the other person in the conversation instead of me. Because I'm talking to a listener. When the listener is really myself. Want to say anything? Then I feel like you're using more than words to communicate. Well, just... It's something that's difficult to put into words. Why don't you tell me something? I like it when you tell me something. <laughs> tell me something? Yeah, no. You know what I mean, though. Like when I was telling you something, it, it might have felt the same way as when you were telling... I don't know. Particular, I was thinking about <coughs> shooting on someone who doesn't have the same level of awareness as you. What do you mean? Like earlier you were talking about how people can be cruel basically by uh, looking down on someone who doesn't have the same level of awareness right. and disparaging them for just making that discovery. That's part of the joke where cruelty comes from. The joke where I don't know what you mean. I guess I refer to jokes, but cruelty comes from what you just said. When people become more aware and then they look down at other people who aren't like them, who are not aware, and then they say those people are bad. That's where it's a self creative process. That's where cruel that's why badness is. That's the idea. Only after you've gone up enough levels do you stop realizing you're being cruel to other people. And usually people will, people will always be pointing outward at other people it, it doing what's called blame. And uh, blaming is actually only significant it's, a, it's a, like a beacon, almost, that they haven't gotten to that level of awareness, where they stop blaming anybody else. Then they start being aware that you should be blaming yourself, and that's okay. And then after that, they should realize that blame is similar to the question about free will and determinism. If you, after you look down at it from high enough, the question is moot. It's, it's meaningless, it's something that people talk about when they're lower. And that's okay, because they're lower. What else would they talk about? You okay? Yeah, you okay? Yeah. You just hadn't moved for such a long time. <laughs> Thinking. All right. On LSD, I tend to have a ton of different interpretations of what a single person is saying to me. Uh -huh. And usually with the intent to communicate, people have a set interpretation in mind. And sometimes people communicate with multiple interpretations in mind. Uh -huh. 
when you communicate with me, I don't really know how many potential interpretations you have in mind. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, I'm aware of that. Uh, during this conversation, and what I will continue to be doing, is we will be pressing up and wrapping around the, the God idea. You can't grasp it, but you can press up and wrap around it. And that's why what I'm saying seems to be inter the number of interpretations is indefinite. And the number of interpretations of valid interpretations, of true interpretations, is indefinite. So we pressed up against the infinity of single interpretations. Normally we think of truth as a single existent thing. But what you're referring to about multiple interpretations and single interpretations and indefinite numbers of interpretations, there's an indefinite number of true interpretations because we're wrapping, we're so close to it. When you, when you do that lateral thing, it's, it's the same as that. It's seeing, it's realizing you were something all along. You've been doing something all along for your entire life and you just never noticed it. And noticing it is called awareness. And wise people are just people that focus on noticing things that everybody's doing. And they just state obvious things. That's how you know how wise they are. Everybody knows they're wise because when they say something, it's completely obvious. And those are the people we think are the smartest. All they do is say obvious things that we're always doing. All they're doing is referring to their ability to look at themselves and see what they're doing. That's what I was going to relate to the filmmaking. Because we go to great lengths to make interesting films about you know fake stories and spend hundreds of millions of dollars when you know you don't need any money to make a film about your life when your life is kind of cool like everybody's life I, I didn't mean to say my life was cool I meant life is cool that's what it is the fact that we are all existing is goddamn fucking amazing and I don't know about you, but I want to look at that all day. I want to look at how cool that is. That we all exist. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing that could ever be. Yes. It's not that that is beautiful, but it's the fact that we can perceive it as beautiful that is beautiful. You talk about varying levels of awareness, right? Uh-huh. So, I'm wondering what level you're at. What do you mean? You said there are varying levels of awareness. Yeah. How, how would I tell you what level I was at? And the only way that I would tell you would be for you to be at the same level, but then you wouldn't ask the question. And maybe by the fact that I answered that way is a statement about what level of awareness I'm at. It's probably a statement for somebody who's higher to know what level I'm at. Because you can only look down. You can't ask me what level of awareness I'm at because you're in the if if you're in the orchard and I'm here. Throughout our conversations I felt like I'm in the orchard. That's because we have that's where that's where we've been. Don't feel, you're not, you don't feel sad because of that, do you? No. Okay, it's, it's, it's not negative? I wasn't thinking about it until you asked me Okay, the okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Lucidity in a dream 
means to be aware that you are existing in a dream. And the more fully aware you are of that, somehow, seemingly, the more fully you are aware to have free will, or something like that. Usually before you become lucid, you realize you haven't, you've, you haven't had free will this entire time. You've just sort of been going along as if you were dreaming, as if you were sleeping, I meant to say. And then you suddenly woke up and you found yourself, oh my god, this is a dream. And now you can choose what to do. Every time you, it's hard to remember, but every time you gain a level of awareness, that's where free will is. You experience a difference there. And you realize that you were doing something that you weren't conscious of the entire time. And yet other people will say you've been choosing to do that. And you'll have to admit, I guess I was choosing to do that. But you weren't aware that you were choosing to do that. That's part of the reason you were choosing to do that, if it was a bad idea. So, free will exists in the awareness changes. If you can have one distinction, in the nature of distinction itself, lies all of logic. If there's a single difference, all of what we call logic comes from that. If you splatter paint against the wall, like that was some kind of big bang or something, in the middles of it, it's all very like the same, but the further out you go, it gets more and more complex, and the number of distinctions and the finerness of the distinctions goes up incredibly, and the further out you go. In the same way with life, bacteria they're like the center of the splatter. Or if you were to drop ink into water and let that move around, it, it only moves around because there's the tiniest my, micrometer, the tiniest difference. There only needs to be one difference for everything to happen. The tiniest difference will make that drop not just go down and hit the bottom of the container, like, you know, nothing would happen and we wouldn't be here to experience anything. but if that drop, if something, if there's one disturbance, or one difference, then it turns into this whole thing where ink, you know, does this whole diffusion thing. And in the center of it, it's completely uniform. But the further out you go from the point at which it met the distinction or the disturbance, it becomes extremely complex and, and there's all these types of flows and the math just gets infinitely hard to understand. And I'm saying that is the nature of reality. When you have a listener, all you do is you take some chunk of you and you say, that's them. And that allows you to express whatever you have in a communication string. And when I'm saying it's you, I'm actually sending it to my idea of you, you know, which is made of me. So as I send it to you, then I have my own process that allows me to be aware of what I'm thinking and saying. And then due to just like humans and social stuff, I get to have another one that's aware of what you know and what you're and what you could possibly be thinking or feeling. So that allows me to that allows me inside my own head to almost or or in some cases more than double my awareness in time of what I'm saying. My awareness of what I'm thinking is smeared out. When normally I could only focus on like one concept at a time, here I can say sentences. I can go longer than sentences. I can have themes to the sentences. Simply because I've cr I've taken a chunk out, and I'm like. This chunk of me, this mind, you have a mind too, so, there. And this relates to the whole consciousness becoming God thing. And we're meshing out. And the number of connections through technology exponentially, exponentially, exponentially meshes. The meshing itself is exponentially, exponentially meshing according to N being the number of parameters at which technology can evolve.
I see one thing I like my mind and uh, if this were a religion or something the whole point of this would be just to like your mind because you find yourself living which whoa I don't, you know you don't notice for a long time really but the whole time you have this problem where you don't know what's going on and you don't know how to make decisions but at some point you need to be okay with that and just be okay and maybe in the future like their mind because when you're living you might as well you know like living that's all when when people talk about when philosophers talk about happiness that's it's a very they could they could just say to like living happiness is an activity huh happiness is an activity that's what a fortune cookie told me the other oh, okay that that i i recently figured out what was going on with that idea and uh, you might not be aware of that idea fully but and when i was in georgia i figured that out i figured that idea out and holy shit it was i never saw it coming well, I, I always saw it coming, which was the funny part. But I realized that, like, okay, I'll say it. You said happiness is an activity. What I perceive that idea to be is I put that with the idea of purpose. And uh, I've, and in, my, in this new religion I'm starting, uh, purpose is what people do they set it up so they feel like they know what they're doing when there is actually no reference point at all in any of this there, there's only living and dying you have to admit her there but you know and they, ref they, and then, uh, they, they represent distinction itself and all that kind of shit purpose yeah purpose is something that people come up with in order to not be aware that they don't know what's going on. They're alive and they don't know this is fucking weird. So they find a purpose and they get in a groove and they just follow that. And they try and follow that and keep away anything that feels bad. Yeah. And that's simply stated my attitude on purpose now. I think that's that purpose is like it's like a, one of those dichotomies that at the lower level people talk about. But purpose was so different because purpose is very sacred to me. Like nobody could really define what purpose was, but purpose was good. This is Telos. Yeah, having purpose. How the question was more how to feel like you have purpose than it was should I have purpose? If you were to start thinking should I have purpose, you'd go a completely lateral direction. I think in the one that I just described. That purpose is just a trick that you do mentally to distract you from the fact that you don't know what the fuck is going on. And the truth is, when people say they believe in God, that's what they do, they believe it. If you knew something factually, you wouldn't say, I believe in this. You know it directly and factually. Like, I refer to God as a fact. And typically people that go around believing in God do it for social reasons. They, they're not aware of all the things they do it for but it's good emotionally, it's good socially, it's good for a lot of things, and all those things are actually insulating you, creating your own groove so that you can have purpose. It's, it's, a, it's a tunneling away from uh, openly experiencing. Okay. Okay, what? Do you understand things better? I mean, you said okay like it was... 
Yeah, I was thinking about what you said in context to my own life. Right. And I felt like it was applicable to my own life. Cool. Technology represents the dichotomy between you and I. Communication does. And because the whole time we've been saying, oh, as technology or communication rises to infinity, then we'll become God. But... I mean, I know it's already there, but... What do you mean? It's always funny when I'm, when I'm thinking about this and then I go on Facebook and, you know... Sometimes something's interesting up there. What am I... Oh, yeah. Ah, yes. The Conscious Community for Action. Notice how they do things for action. That's purpose. I have compassion for people that say that life is a certain way because that means all they can remember is it being a certain way when life can be a lot of ways right and uh, if you had it in more ways you would be aware you'd, the more ways you had life the easier it would be to be aware that, that life you were, isn't a certain way that life isn't a certain way and typically like reason number two that people kill themselves is because life is a certain way and they don't like it. So why wouldn't you kill it? I mean, you don't like life, so just stop doing it. It seems pretty simple to me. But they've only, they've, haven't experienced life in many ways. And the more ways you experience life, the more you can be aware that you're living. Which is actually harder to do than it seems. Imagine you had this just un I'm sure I'm thinking of like untenable genius. I don't even know if that's a word. But just you know, just somebody that was so incredibly geniusy that you could just not hold them back. Uh, should they be in school? No, probably not. They should probably they're they should probably just learn whatever they think is right. Because we don't get a lot of those guys coming around here that often and schools for other, for people that aren't you, genius, you know. Please, just make us some art. We want more of that. We wish we had more. We wish it was easier to eat and we didn't have to work all the time. Can you give us more technology? Please, anything it would be. Just make it more comfortable and bearable and leisurely to live. And in the way that we're having this conversation is very different than that book. That book is the same thing, but it's done academically. And I don't like that. Because in the whole book they're saying how it applies to everything in reality, but this guy who you, like, his parents were Harvard professors, he was born on Stanford campus, and grew up there and got his PhD there. He can't help but be academic, so, yeah, don't worry about him. You know, he knows a lot, of, a ton of languages, he's read everything in humanities, he has a, like, PhD in physics and philosophy, or, you know, he, he's fucking smart. But he's academic, so, you know, I'm just, I never got along with that, and that's why I, I'm not writing that book. I'm doing this. don't fully understand what you're doing. Uh, it's just saying simple things about living. Just noticing things that we've been doing the whole time. And just validly relating concepts. And then somehow we get to the nature of reality over there with the ink and the display and the bacteria and, bac and technology and God and everything interesting. I, I have no idea what I'm going to do in the future. 
Like if I really like if I really think like this all the time, I I'm not sure if I should like be going into having a job or like living in a house. I'm not, I'm not sure what life should be like for me. And in some and you know then I also refer to like you know I don't want to be disrespectful. That would be being disrespectful to other people to be like I'm sufficiently different that I don't have to do effort like you. But then again, all this is obviously effort. I'm just very good at doing this effort, I guess. When I'm probably, like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how I should live. And that's part of the thing, because I'm, I'm supposedly the wise one who's pointing out, you know, all these things about living, but I don't know what I should do tomorrow.